Welcome back, everyone. We hope that uh, you have had a chance to get a little bit of lunch and are ready to ask your questions of the three you see here on the screen. We have Chuck and Stein and Joe with us. And so as you come up with a question, go ahead and type that in. We have a few that were submitted in advance. And I know that Chuck is going to show off a new goodie. And then a lot of you wanted to see how the map that we used for our firm a display to show where all the firms were coming from. I know that that's on the list too. And so go ahead and type those questions in. While you're doing that, I'm going to turn things over to Chuck to right. for him to show the new goodie that we missed, I think, the first of the week. There you go, oh, Chuck. We're seeing your screen. Right. Very good. Well, the big deal is there is a new uh, quick report key. Now, as you remember, when you're in student manager, you press F1 to show the keyboard shortcuts. And F2 was the enrollment report, which is one of my favorites. F3 was the instructor search, which is good. F5 was the name search, which has always been there. But wait, we missed one. F4 find registration. Well, this beautiful little creature allows you to search for registrations based on any combination of factors between the name, the course, and the registration. Now, it does not reference amount paid. Of course, for that, you'd need to use the F7 key, which looks up payments. But what you can do with the F4 is if you say, I wanted to know all of Havlicek's registrations in courses, if I spell that right, Havlicek, C-E-C-K, I can't spell my own name. Havlicek's courses in all of the courses that have the subject code of ACEWARE. I hit the OK button, boom, all of my classes that have ACEWARE as a subject code. Um, again, uh, like other quick reports, there is, an ex there is an output option. You've got options to do the sort, and you can add a, you can make a custom condition, which I believe covers between name, register, and course, and you can add extra fields to the, the view list. So again, I am excited about that. Uh, let's try that again, because I'm trying to think whether, yeah, we do show the fee amount um, on that. So that is the base fee from the register table uh, of what you charge for that fee. So anyway, uh, that is the brand new feature. We actually put that, Matthew built that uh, several builds ago, like earlier in the year and we were going to hold it for the conference. We forgot to show it, so there you go. F4, it is wonderful. Check it out. Uh, so I'm good on that. Um, Joe, you wanna show uh, um, b b mapping, or do you want me to? I've got it set up on mine. I got either one. I was gonna go ahead and show the one that we've go been for using it. for the conference, go for it. too. All right. <clears throat> Sharon, if you'd like to. Show my screen. Which screen is it going I to be? I have on? handed things off to Joe. Joe, we're seeing your student manager screen. Awesome. I can't see which screen I'm showing. <laughs> You're on the student manager plane. Okay, cool. Um, so it was mentioned that somebody was asking about what the mapping that we were using for this conference. Uh, we've used it at last conference too. But that is using the, the do mapping from just after ran out of uh, demographic smelling labels. If you don't have it already, it's just use whatever demographic uh, mailing label report you want to run. Just throw the just after for do mapping. And you can run your report to bring up oh, that one. Uh,
done this like five times. I should know the course number by now. And we have ours just named as mapping. And it just runs your regular, just like any other mailing label that you would have. Um, I think this was built off the default one. But once you run it, you can say whether or not you want to send it to the printer and you can either run it by name or you can run it by firm. I've been running it by firm for this conference just so we can kind of you know, not give away everybody's name. But you can clear on whichever one you want and then it's going to take a few moments to run through and create the map. Um, one of the caveats is, is that you do need to have a Bing key created, uh, which I don't actually have on my demo, which is why we're doing it off of the uh, information, or off the database here. But we have, there we go, look at that. It just popped right up. And now I know where everybody is. But we do have instructions on how to uh, how to get your Bing key if you don't have one already. Um, you may want to make sure that you have the right uh, zip file as well for the mapping.zip. But other than that, it's, it's pretty straightforward on that. Any questions on that part? Not that I'm seeing right now, but if they come, I'll throw those back to you. Okay. Well, if, you, if anybody does have any more questions about mapping, you know, feel free to reach out to your technician. Um, we, yeah. Okay. Chuck, are you seeing the questions here, or do you want me to read them aloud? Oh, you're off. Sorry, was is slurping some ramen in ramen in <laughs> questions here. Um, um, Actually, I am going to make me the presenter here because I want to demo something. We have a question from Brittany related to mapping that says, I just want to display a given state area. And the answer on that would be, of course, yes, what you can do is the data that is being uh, generated is whatever you have in your query. So if you say, I want to run just people for one state, um, and you're watching me, right? You're looking at me. All right. So if I said, I want anybody from Kansas, just put in a query for the state of Kansas, go to your, um, go to your, um, report. Now this actually highlights a, another function that is old. It's been around for years, but this allows you called a uh, zip radius. And the zip radius function allows you to put in a zip code and do a tight radius. Well, tight or loose, however you want it. So if we wanted 500 mile radius, I, I don't have a plain report for mapping without zip radius. If I say, I want to have a radius of 500 miles from my zip code, which because of my query said Kansas, I'm only going to get Kansas, but whatever. And it will then pull up all of the people. Now my query said Kansas, so I'm limited to Kansas. But so if there was anybody out in way, way west Kansas that's beyond 500 miles, they wouldn't show there. But anyway, that's how you do it. Just basically use the um, um, use your query to to set, uh, to centralize your list. But now again, Brittany or anybody else. If you say, I have an evening class, and it meets multiple weeks, and so people are not going to drive more than 50 miles to my evening class, no matter how good it is, you could use that um, uh, zip radius function to bring up the, the map and only show, we're bringing up the map here, only show those people within a certain radius of, of where you are. All right, um, and I'm waiting for my map to come up here. So anyway, uh, well, while we're waiting for that, let's see other questions. Um, anybody else want to chime in? Uh, Stein, Joe? Question here. Time, chime. I don't know. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I, we've got a question about instru- information to the instructor. Um, the fee option. Name roster shows course fee and the amount um, on quick reports. I think the question, uh, well, we're not, my, my uh, map is not wanting to show, so we'll get back to that. Emma is asking about course rosters being able to show multiple fee options on that. And I believe that should be doable. If we're talking about quick reports and name roster, uh, again, well, uh, there are different formats of rosters. You should be able to add Emma to your roster. Let's look at an alternate report. And I'm going to modify just in case. Uh, roster with fee details. Preview that. So again, uh, total paid, course fee, yeah. The default roster in my case here doesn't have the fee description. So all you'd need to do <clears throat> would be to add, and I'm not going to worry about formatting of this, but go in and add the course fee description, RG, RG fee desk. And that's registration, early bird fee, registration fee. Emma, if that's what you want, I believe that's it. All you need to do is add the fee description to the um, to the roster. So, Can I repeat that question so everybody knows exactly what the question was, perhaps? Go for it. Her, her question was for classes with multiple fee options, but at the same price point. Is there a simple way to send a report to the instructor that includes this info. And she gave an example. We have a class with an online fee option and an in-person fee option, and both fees are the same. Is there an easy way to send a roster with this information to the instructor? And this is what Chuck was demonstrating here. Now, uh, I, I'm looking at the, uh, no, 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 just a second. Um, I was looking at the send quick roster to instructor from the uh, quick mail on, on the quick reports. Right now, now what, in order to do what Emma is asking for, you'd need to use a regular roster, save it as a PDF and send it. Uh, the send email roster to instructor again, does show the paid status. It doesn't show the fee that they paid or the fee description. I can ask Matthew, we can put that on the wish list to see if that would be, um, and Emma nod if you if think that's what you want. Uh, I'll ask and see if we can add the fee description as a field to export for the uh, instructor, because I agree, I see what you're saying. Um, that that might be useful for the instructors. So, so. Okay, and she is nodding her head or giving a thumbs up, <laughs> and she's saying, "Yes, that will be great." Okay. All okay. right. Let's skip. We have a question from Jill here. To you, is there any chance that in Quick Reports there could be an email contract to instructor link? Is there any chance that in Quick Reports there could be an email contract to instructor link? Who would like to take that question? <clears throat> well, uh, that, that is a Matthew question as far as now the faculty contract does have um, one of the things you can do is generate a PDF on the fly and email it to that student at the same time. So if we did a PDF of an instructor contract, also email output file. Um, now this is not specifically what you are asking for, Jill, but uh, this does have to give you the option, oh, we're running different reports, class roster, oh, I've got modify on and all of the other ones, you'll have to bear with me. Cancel. There's send quick mail. Cancel. Yes. Okay. Um, 
But there is, if you go to the faculty record itself, we go to Havlicek. One of the things you can do is go to quick reports. Now I take that back. That's a quick report that does not have. Do you mind if I interject? Go, yes, absolutely. Because I'm sorry. Uh, you can actually send a uh, your contracts out of the quick reports under the course. Uh, Chuck, if you go back to that course for me real quick, please. All righty. All right, click on oh, quick, quick report. report. Uncheck the name roster, and what you'll see is at the bottom, email separately will open up. So you can actually click on faculty contract again. Oh, where's email separately? Click on the, yep, click that now. And then right there oh. under email canceled. You can actually well, you run know. it through the normal routine and run your normal instructor contract report that you would send out to them anyways. And once it's done, why is it trying to send now this, the message? That message should say uh, contracts to these students yeah. now. Uh, and that is, again, would be faculty contract. And I should get that, find your faculty contract and files to attach to, P in addition, PDF. I must have, I'm going to cancel that total of one email sent. So let's see if that, uh, uh, who's, what's the email I have on my account? Edit instructor record, Chuck at Aceware. Uh, it doesn't have it yet, it hasn't come in yet. I'll check back on that. But yeah, uh, uh, Joe, thank you. I I guess I did not, I was not aware of that, but this email separately, and again, it is set up to do, work for certificates. Apparently it's also set up for contracts. There does appear to be some wording issues. We'll get that to Matthew about trying to centralize the wording, so. Um, uh, okay. All right. I have a couple right. here from Nancy. She's asking if there's a way in Manager to send a confirmation with a calendar attachment. Joe, you want to handle that? Or you want well, to throw it under the bus? Yeah, you can. You can uh, include attachments with your reminders, I believe. Now I'm doubting myself. Hold on. This is confirmation. I, Nancy, you can clarify if you want, but I'm understanding that you want it with the confirmation notice so folks can add that to their calendar, add their course they registered for to their calendar. Um, yeah, and I believe... So, go ahead, is this a, Sorry, is this a, uh, are we talking about the confirmation out of manager or are we talking about the confirmation out of AceWeb? Because if we're talking about the one out of, out of AceWeb, under your regconfirm.txt, under AceWeb, you can actually go to the very bottom of your template and remove out the Xs from the vCal, and that will include the calendar, uh, the .ics calendar attachment, into that email for the recipient. i got to remember if you can do that in Student Manager. I'm pretty sure you can. But. I'm pretty sure that Matthew, and again, a lot of the email questions, uh, we had Matthew do an email this morning, um, that you can uh, add an iCal to an email, but again, I don't have that at the top of my head, so we'll need to follow up on that and uh, send a note back about the adding iCal, the, which is a calendar, to your email confirmation. So. Um, all right, there was another question in there from Nancy. To answer that question, actually, yes, you can uh, include the attachment. So if you want to include a calendar attachment file, um, you have to have like the appropriate software and stuff on there. You can, when you're doing your email receipt, you can actually click on the send calendar attachment file and include the actual attachment for it. Let's... It doesn't automatically create the, the ICS. You already have to have it created. So if you so if we're talking about the automatic ones, those are going to come at AceWeb. Uh, with Student Manager, it's going to be a file that you've actually created. Oh, there it is right there. Yeah, on the on the registration receipt. Now, I don't know um I don't know whether or not um this is in 
the conference release, I think this has been out there for a while, but on the email, uh, when you're generating a receipt from student manager, you do see the send calendar attachment file. And again, Jill, I think you guys have been out of date for a while or you have an older version. I'm sure you do not have that. So that would be something the upgrade will give you. So um, course input wizard. And I am not sure there was a question from Nancy about the course import wizard. Um, the, I believe that's under import export course import wizard, um, I'm, the question is, is, is there a help document on that? I'm not sure, so let's check that out. So if we go to the help guide and we get student manager help, C-O-U, we'll do import. I think you'll find that we've got one on names. Well, there it is, course import wizard. So um, Nancy, there is one. Try searching that again. And import wizard appears to be uh, the the tool that you would get. So I believe that should, uh, that should get you in there. Uh, to do. All right. Also with that, you can also get a template that you can use to um, for the import that's already on our website. Um, Lynn has a question, and uh, this is again back to the importing again. Uh, is there any way to embed the calendar link similar, oh, okay, similar to how Zoom does this, um, and that's embedding the calendar link inside the email. Uh, that would be, again, a Matthew question. So again, we're, we're getting lots of, uh, in essence, wish list items. So again, that we will put on the wish list uh, to check with Matthew on. So Lynn, uh, that'll be one we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna need to punt and, uh, uh, discuss about that with Matthew, see if we can't put that on a wish list. Um, all right, uh, we're running out of questions, guys. Uh, keep them coming. Uh, Sharon, there were a couple of things well, on my I note. See, I, know. You, I see, uh, we're seeing your, okay. I see a question from Kelly. She says, for the map, this is back to the mapping function, Joe and Chuck. Is there a way to get a map based on a field? She's talking with international students, and we put the U.S. address in student manager, but they also want to put what country the student is from, from the country field. I, 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 we need Matthew in this. <laughs> uh, the, um, that's one I don't think. Whoop, you got a loop. I don't think that because we're using Bing Maps, uh, we're limited by what Bing allows you to do. And I think um, unless we were to fake the name in the feed to the uh, Bing, uh, but I think what Kelly is asking about is if she used a user-defined field to put the, the student's home country in, can that field be posted on the map? Um, uh, that's a good question. I'm not aware of how we do that, how you do that without cheating, you know, uh, putting the country name in the last name field, which screws up your data, which you obviously wouldn't want to do. So, well, um, I'm trying it right now. I'm just seeing if I can try to do it off my demo. I don't know if I right. have anything. So we'll let, we'll let, um, we'll let Joe play with that, uh, Kelly. And, uh, that again is a, a question that, uh, we'll need to run it by the programmer because that, that's getting into some of the customizing the Bing uh, map. Um, okay, while we are waiting for other questions, keep them coming, guys. One of the quest one of the things yesterday that was a question asked and I didn't get it covered for Miss Brittany was if you were doing Pocket Ledger. Uh, here we go, Pocket Ledger uh, mass entry. 
And so you wanted to add a five hundred dollar. You wanted to add the the marketing, the printing costs for a uh, um, um, printing cost for the catalog. Catalog printing, and it's five hundred dollars. We're just putting in some numbers. Distribute the expense. We need a, um, and we're going to say department name is Ace uh, would be. Account number, coordinator name is Havlicek. Um, preview. Okay, so those are all the names. And we say, okay, we want to do that. Yes, we're going to do that. And we say, oh, crap, that's not the right dollar amount. It should have been $600. Or I had people, I had courses in there that I did not want. And I guess the point is you screwed up on your mass distribution. So you have 50 courses with the wrong amount or the wrong description in it. Well, what, hap what you can do is if you notice that, before you start to edit individual ones, go to one of those expenses, that's a bad one, hit the delete button, and it should ask you this is a mass pocket ledger entry. Would you like to delete them all? So you say yes, and then every one of those entries would be deleted. So if I go back to this record, it is not there. So again, that is a way to get to clean up or to get rid of a mass, a mass distribute that went bad. All right, Sharon, go for it. You've got some other questions here. Okay, we have another from Ms. Brittany. I have several instances of customers having two email addresses, their personal one and their training coordinator. Would there be a way to have an email to in the names screen at some point in the future? I should not have let Matthew have a lunch break today. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, th th that again, the answer is uh, anything's possible. I guess we I need to know how that would be used. Um, of course, one of the things that I would recommend for the present time is if you've got a user-defined field, one of the character fields on the name record that you're not currently using or the new unlimited UDF, that you could tag a email address that is unique to that name. So that would be um, that would be my recommendation there. So okay, um, a question here from Emma. Sorry, Emma, I have to scroll to the right location here. How can I find the language needed to modify a report? I saw Chuck type. Reg fee or reg or um, RG fee, but I'm not sure what comes after that. So the list of those that language for modifying reports. Well, uh, there's a couple of things. One, if you have never modified reports, uh, you've got some study to do, and I would direct you for that to the webinar archive. Um, in the reporting tools, there are hours and hours and hours of, of, of functions in here about reporting. And this video series, Report Modification, Basics, Aesthetics, Intermediate, Extreme, um, and then Guide to the Reporting Galaxy. So there's four or five hours of general report writing tips that anybody can come in and use. There is also on the help guide, if you are a reader rather than a watcher, uh, you can go into reports and there is a section on modifying reports. Specifically to, I think, your question about, okay, what was the name of that mask man? What was that field name that Chuck used that put what I wanted on the screen? Uh, on Matthew reference this morning is that under help screen layout. So right from the main help screen under all topics, screen layout, go to the registration screen, you hover over the field name, and it'll give you that name of the field, which is, if you would, the scientific name to put on the report. 
All right. Okay. Can I can, uh, I, can I circle oh. back to the question that Kelly had about the countries? Go for it. Okay, so countries is a field that you can populate in manager, and yes, the mapping will show countries. How 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 do you do that? I mean, is that done through the mapping function or or what? Yeah, it's done through the mapping function. It, it would ah. look at it looks at the country address as well. Like if you're just, you can also do it off of the query too. If you're just looking for, you know, show me all the countries my all of my students ah. have been in, you can just select countries that are not empty. And there you go. I mean, I've got. Well, I think what I think what I heard Kelly saying was she wanted to show she wanted to show on the map instead of the person's name the country that they were from. So mm. not query on saying just people from Nigeria, but okay. we wanted to show every student, no matter where they live in the US, but to show their origin country on there. And that's what I'm thinking um, that she's looking for. So that is probably going to be a Matthew question. That so. will be back to Matthew. But if you just want to show the show show country, or you know, people from different countries. You you can right. Run you can it certainly query on that, but that would mm -hmm. uh, that would just give you only. But you're right, J uh, Matthew. So if you had a limited number of countries, or you say, I just want to see where my Chinese students are living in New York City or wherever you're at, you could query on the whatever the field you put the country in when you go into the mapping, and then it'll only show those names in the map, but you'd have to run multiple iterations to show the multiple countries if you've got several. So, um, um, okay. Matthew, Stein, or, uh, sure, sure. Stein thinks he's off the hook there, but I'm going to give him a few questions here. Stein, these are related. This comes from Rachel at Whatcom. These are related to Quick Pick, and she has a two-part question, so I'll do one part at a time for you, okay? Okay. okay. She says currently they're not using Quick Pick. Um, the option, but if you set a course as a quick pick, will it only be displayed in this way or will it still show up in our complete listing of courses? And then I'll do part two when you're done there. Okay, no, it, it uh, shows, uh, you specify a course to be shown in quick pick by putting it in a group. And then when you configure your quick pick, you say, uh, we want to show uh, I'll, uh, you, you list the groups that you want to show, and then it'll uh, uh, categorize them by the groups. And uh, so you can set up a special group for quick pick, but the regular behavior of the course continues as it always did in your, uh, uh, so if it was set up to publish uh, on the regular course list, it'll still be there. It'll just now, if you've added that group, it'll show on the quick pick uh, page. Okay, and, and this is probably just leans um, off of that and has a similar answer. Is it all or nothing? Um, all classes are quick picks, or you can set it to certain codes or subject codes or coordinator codes. So, well, it was it, it's group group codes, but yes, uh, uh, you can run you can run them in parallel. Um, we try to. Uh, it, it works better from the user standpoint if they don't jump back and forth from quick pick to the regular courses uh, so that uh, the, the quick pick uh, sequence will take them from the quick pick page directly to the checkout page. And from there, ideally, they'll go ahead and pay for their courses and complete the registration. Uh, if they want to veer off into the other direction um, and, and add courses through the regular route, it is possible, but things might get a little confusing because the two interfaces are have somewhat different mindset. But um, so we do have some customers who only use Quick Pick. Uh, they have a, a, a an alternate interface set up for the Quick Pick registrations, and that's all that happens on that side but we do also have people running things in parallel and uh, it sort of de usually in those cases depends on the starting point if they start with your your regular course list uh, 
they'll go through the regular, the, the, the standard legacy sequence of bringing up a course and putting it in the enrollment cart and then going around and around again. With Quick Pick, the idea is you bring up the page, you select the courses you want, they all go on your cart in one uh, operation, and then you check out right away. And uh, and so it, it's, again, ideally, it's aimed at uh, people running programs where they have people signing up, students signing up for lots of courses at once. So you can go in and you have a OLLI program and people want to get on. They've got 10 different courses they want. Uh, they select them all on Quick Pick. There's one click to check out and they can review their courses, one more click to pay and they're done. So uh, that's uh, that's what that, uh, <clears throat> it, it's that that scenario that, that Quick Pick really shines. So. Hey, very good, thank you. And um, if there, Rachel, if you have other questions, just drop them in there and I'll get them to sign here. Um, Carolyn asks, she says the firm tape, this is going to be a Matthew thing. I can't wait for Matthew to be back to share all this with him and and uh, he will be on tomorrow so I'll get him an extra Mountain Dew or something to kind of handle all this. But the firm table does not have additional UDF fields like name table. Possible to add more UDF fields for the firm table. What do you think? Sorry, there you go. We do have four user-defined fields, um, Carolyn, so I guess do you need more than that? Um, and I guess this is billing info, additional information. There is an, a generic additional information tab. So again, I, I, if you wouldn't mind shooting an example of what else you'd like to have besides we have two true-false and two character, and again, the way those can be edited is through the firm table uh, where you can set your their variables. So let it, let's shoot a note about what are some others <clears throat> that you might want or what else you'd like to track on a firm. And, and again, we can see if we can do it with the current system or if that something goes on a wish list. So, all right. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. All right. So um, um, show in the quick email. All right, we've got some others. Um, okay, uh, let me, um, there was a couple of items that we had that were leftovers. Um, uh, version 7, class C limits. <clears throat> um, one of the things that is a, a feature in Student Manager that was in an earlier spring release is called Class Fee Limits. And what you can do on that is that when you have a course with multiple fees, a reg fee, member fee, staff fee, if you've got, say, a staff fee of zero, and I there are a couple of schools that actually offer staff a complete free uh, registration, well, you say, well, that's great, but if everybody in the class registers for the class fee, I don't make any money on the class. Well, what you can do on any regular registration fee now is to set a maximum. So if you say, we want to set a max of three people, two people, only two people can register in this class at the staff fee of zero before that staff fee goes away. So again, that is supported on ACE Web as well as in Student Manager. So again, if you've got uh, discount fees for classes and you'd like to meter those, you'd like to limit access on those, uh, you're able to do that. Now, okay, I'm gonna give a, this is a preview of what I'm gonna cover Friday some, but for those of you now in the new normal with on-site classes maybe being blended with a Zoom uh, parallel class, <clears throat> one of the options there would be, and let me see if I can get to one that's a simpler fee structure, is that if you said, if this 
if this registration fee is the on-site fee, and I'm going to add another fee, which would be the online fee. I don't know if I've got an online fee. Let's make one real quick. Oh, yes, shush up. Uh, we want to add a fee here. Uh, we'll call this a, don't have it. I don't have an online fee option. Let's go, set package rate. If this was the online fee, and we're going to say that was um, $800 versus the 1000 we we charge extra to be in person. But because of the new rules about class size, we can only handle five people in the class for the in-class butts and seats fee. But on the online, we're going to take up to 30 additional people online. Uh, or you could have that unlimited. That could be 999. You'll have an unlimited number of people. Now let's see if I can get in this online fee. Online fee, and we're going to add that. We'll say butts. Yep, slow down here. Band cancel. Trying to speed up things here. So if we wanted to do butts, ah, oh, come on. But in but in seed fee. All right, so if you're with me on that, but in seed fee, online fee. So again, you're able to set a maximum for those, but still allow people to come in through your Zoom option or a, a virtual broadcast option, as many people as you want, or whatever limit on that. So that fee limits option uh, is something that I would think that you're going to be able to use quite a bit um, in in that system. Uh, uh, Emma has a question about go. Go. Oh, Sorry. Go ahead. Emma has a question related to this. She wants to know if there will be an alert, you know, like the overbooking alerts we get, if they try to enroll an additional person over the max of a particular fee, fee limit. I believe so. Yeah, the same as the same as so right now my butts and seat is 5. If I try to oh, let's uh let's go find Well, it, it the same rules apply for enrollments uh in a class. Um you'll get the warning this this class is full. Um do you want to overbook? Uh, so that again, you do have that option. Um, I'm trying to think uh, where you have a split one where one fee is full. I'd have to test that, but the the, the warning limit would pop up for that. Uh, if you'd want to see if there's another question, uh, or Joe uh, Stein, you want to comment in on the fee limits while I set up a, uh, some examples here to see if we can test that. Okay, I'm looking here. One, I don't see. I'm not sure. I haven't actually played actually. around with that part. I'm setting up on my own demo to try to replicate that. So. Well, I'm, that's what I'm doing right now, is now. seeing if we can add another name to this class. Well, Until you're getting lots week. of shout-outs and hoorays for the fee limitations, the automated fee limitations. Okay, so here oh, is here. you have filled the last seat in the class morning. Uh, no, we don't want to group it. Now we're going to add a, a person that should oh, – dang, I keep picking the same guy. Uh, George Bush. George isn't in the class. There it is. So course is full. Class maximum has been reached. What do you want to do? Let's still pick new class and say, well, Jeff Brown needs to register in the online fee. Let's save that. And it did that just fine. So it was able, well, let's try that again. Add edit Reggie's, add Jenny Call. I want to continue. No. Now that is, now, it did switch them to the online fee automatically, and now it didn't ask us on that, so that's a little bit. So we have butt in seat, online fee, online fee. Um, that did 
that did flip them from one to the other, but it didn't ask. So we might, uh, we'll, we'll let us check on that with Matthew again about the behavior um, on that, because um, like I said, I was trying to throw an example together and didn't really put a good one, but uh, uh, we'll double check this to, to make sure that the logic of that fits uh, fits so that presumably what I would think it should do is that um, from student manager's point of view, um, it should say, uh, well, I guess if you, if you, there should be an option on that overbook to be able to say, register as an online student because it's, um, it did switch it to online as the fee type, but it didn't ask or warn you so if I'm adding one more person, that it should say course full or this fee is full. Fee butts and seats is full. Do you want to enroll in the other course? Now on the web, Stein, you might explain what happens on the web when that course is full. I think what the fee, the the butts and seats option fee just goes away, right? Right. I'm talking right, too well, much. You guys, um, Stein, anybody else want to uh, to do? Sharon, what else we got yeah. there? Uh, yeah, on the web, yeah. We, we, we try to, we try to, to do a pro, proactive, uh, uh, you know, and there's no option to overbook. It just goes away. So, but um, I think you're right. Uh, Matthew may want to uh, refine that dialogue a little bit and, indicate whether it's actually the course maximum or the fee maximum that was reached and maybe add another option. Okay. There was sure. a question about the fee limitations. If Would this fee enrollment limitations work if all fees are zero for free community events? Um, yes. yes, it should. It yeah, should but, still count the noses. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't care the amount of the fee, it'll still do the count. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, let me, I was, uh, let me wait, let's the student get back to that. So if you had a fee that was zero, the, what, it, what it goes off of is not the fee dollar amount, but it goes off of the fee description. So you can have as many different fee descriptions as you want, and for each unique fee description, you can have a different max. So yeah, you you can, uh, the dollar amount doesn't make any difference. It's the description that you have for this fee in this class. And again, uh, you could have a different course where you have a, a fee of butts and seats and of whatever dollar amount you want and have no limit. You just let people, so again, that's on a class by class basis that fee limits is set up so all right Sharon what we got here do, 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 do. I am looking I am looking oh we've oh, got one got. Melissa Chase she's <laughs> causing trouble again <laughs> yeah. uh Sharon you want me to read that aloud I told Go her I would it. certainly Let put this on the that. wish list yeah. but her question everybody and her wish list item is to be able to apply escrow to individual grouping instead of having to ungroup and apply separately. So, which if there's a remaining balance due, it will show on the receipt, or if monies remain in escrow, just stays in escrow, and she knew. She said, wish list at the end. So Yeah. Um, I can see I, a couple of logical issues with that, but I don't, I don't know outside of that for myself, though. Yeah, I that's a, I know uh, Stein has been able to obviously with the new apply escrow online address that from student manager. I think because of the different options we give you to apply escrow, you know, there's all the funky percentage or uh, based on fee level or uh, equally apply that trying to take different escrow payments and splitting them all up on that is a uh, booger. Uh, so 
but I know Matthew and Stein have been looking at this, uh, so we can put that on the wish list. No promises on that, but uh, we'll certainly have him uh, have those guys take a look at that. So, if you're if you're talking on the online, it's strictly uh, individual uh, user. Uh, whatever escrow belongs to, you know, user Chuck Havlicek uh, with user ID X Y Z one two three four five. Uh, those are the escrow accounts that are uh, records that are available online, and and there is no distinguishing if it's if Chuck's escrow totals to $123, then he gets that credit online, and we'll use those records up as we need them to cover that online purchase. But there's not going to be any dividing up among courses or anything like that, and you can put that on the wish list. And uh, it's uh, and you can wish for a pretty long time because that gets just way too complicated to do online. So, so it's going to be you know a, a, a in, based on the individual and the total escrow, and it'll either be applied or not applied. So, yeah. um, I'm go uh, Sharon. How about letting uh, Matt uh, Stein take a crack at Brittany's question there? Although. I don't know if he's got an example that, that we might shoot out to him. Okay, which question are Brittany you? Brittany one. Uh, I'll, oh, I'll go ahead and okay. answer that. Stein, this is uh, from Brittany, so she's she's going to challenge you here. Uh, do you have an example of a person uh, page on your web demos that uses unlimited UDFs, the new, um, you know, create unlimited UDFs option? Um, I don't know that we've got one on Ace Web Demo. Uh, but do you have one in your uh, code somewhere, or Joe? Do you have one for customers that you've got laid out? I don't or... have an example, no. Um, for which area? For, for, well, I... this would be the new unlimited UDFs option, Joe, that that Matthew has, where you can create a UDF on the fly. Oh. I I don't know of one right now that I can show. Um, but uh, that's one that we can actually bump to Jason and see if he can create or share it or Cheryl now who is coming back uh, on the ace web demo to be able to put an example of that in your ace web demo and while we're while we're talking that and and getting into ace web uh, info uh, one of the things that let me get one of the things I would recommend, uh, if you haven't done this, is that if you haven't gone into the Ace Web Portal demo, which is our sandbox, go in and take a look at that. And in the examples area, you've got lots of different examples of the different features that you could do in Ace Web. Um, Brittany, this is where I'm going to see if I can get Cheryl or Jason to create an example of an unlimited UDF field uh, on a uh, example, a sample course. Um, so again, I, I think that would be that's an excellent uh, point, and I don't know that we've got it uh, in the demo yet for being able to play with. So, okay, um, what do we got? Do, 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 do. Overbooking. Um, Stein, any uh, trying to think? Oh, uh, there is a question here, and I will uh, jump back to Lynn Harsh. Lynn, I didn't mean to overlook you for so. Lynn is asking, is there any current integration between Aceware and Blackboard? I did a quick response, but Stein, you might kind of share some of the development that uh, we're thinking about or going on with that. Aceware uh, and Blackboard, or integration with LMSs here. Yeah, we've. Uh... We've had, uh, we actually have AceWeb working with uh, Blackboard on one campus at Auburn, um, where, uh, and we just had discussions with another campus uh, uh, about doing the same thing. Both cases, the campus Blackboard team was uh, in, the, in the one that's actually working and what we had projected for this other place. It would be a que uh, issue of um, after a student has registered uh, online, we will export, ACEWEB will automatically export a packet of information 
to the Blackboard uh, side on that campus, and their team is going to take that information and plug it into their Blackboard. So that, so the integration, it's taking, it's it's not automatic. It takes some work on the part of the Blackboard team on the individual campus, and uh, I and in both cases, it's probably. Uh, uh, the what we export will is customized to their request although maybe uh, at some point we can kind of just standardize that and say here's a uh all the possible information blackboard might le need and we will export it and then your blackboard people can take over from there um, but um, we also do have something built into ace web that is not used by a lot of campuses now, but we have an online portal option that once you've enrolled in an online course, you can go over to your course history page and we can generate a link that will take the user from their page into their online course. So uh, we've got a couple of things, but both take a little uh, configuration and have to be customized for the particular LMS that's, uh, that's being run being uh that we're trying to integrate to okay we're kind of uh fairly well caught up here uh, uh joe um a uh, stein any other things you've been setting in on some of the sessions that you'd want to kind of do a shout out or um, a reference before we uh, let Sh uh, sharon wrap this up and let Not people have a bit of a break you know. before the next email session. I think. I think. I, I okay. just, uh, just mentioned that the uh, the new goodies in AceWeb uh, that was shown yesterday. I got uh, a little excited because I had a, a question from a user who thought they were uh, actually uh, all out and running and Already, some of them yeah. are and some of them are will be part of our conference release which will come out after conference it's still uh partly under construction and still needs to be thoroughly tested at our end before we can release it so it's going to be at least uh, i would think a couple of weeks uh to later this month that it actually that you get to actually see some of those features uh the, the main one being the escrow feature because that's definitely uh, something we're still working on, but uh, we'll we'll push to get it out as quickly as possible. But it's not quite there yet. Um, I do have um, uh, Nicole Soul uh, from Montana made the comment that they are using unlimited UDFs for uh, one of their courses at Montana. Um, uh, Nicole, if you wouldn't mind. Um, Set, type in the URL for, or, or copy and paste the link to that class on, um, I guess, although, is that on the name side, uh, um, Nicole, or is that as a um, supplemental data field uh, in a registration? But anyway, they are using it. Um, I will get uh, Nicole and Brittany together so that uh, you guys could perhaps uh, take us, do some sharing on that. But Nicole uh, Montana, and Nicole, would you mind if, if, if people were interested, uh, we share your name? Uh, so we'll, 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 we may be able, we have one in the wild on that, and so we'd be able to share that with people. So, Sharon, I, uh, okay, very good. We'll get a link from um, Nicole on that. And um, Sharon, I'm, 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 are we pretty well? You're coming back in charge now. Charge now. You are. We go. You are. And so, yes, we'll give uh, customers and we'll give ourselves just a little bit of break to get set up for 1.30, where Maxie will be joining us from UTEP to talk about how they use coding for success in their programs. So until then, we will um, say goodbye and we will see you soon. Thanks much, everybody. Bye-bye.